Hi, everybody. Welcome to Tri-Cities Community Television. My name is Patrick McCarthy. We're in our Fountainhead Studios, which is on Westwood in Port Coquitlam. And uh, today we have always uh, give you a chance to sort of learn about new candidates that are running, and in this case, in the city of Port Moody. So Port Rich, Moody. Richard uh, Bitka is here today. Yeah. So uh, welcome, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good to see you. Me. And of course, as a new candidate, you know, you want to sort of, uh, people have a chance to know you, yes. or can you give us a sense of who you are and, and kind of why you're running? And that sure. would be great. Um, I'm a Tri-Cities boy. I grew up in Coquitlam. And uh, I uh, went to UBC. I've got a Bachelor of Science degree in biology, majors in marine biology. Uh, I worked uh, a little bit as a field biologist, uh, did a bit in the agriculture industry, and ended up in the commercial seafood industry, where I worked my way up through the ranks to vice presidents of domestic and international sales. And previous to that, or post that job, I was the national account manager for uh, another uh, USA head company. Um, and I've had a lot of experience on senior management teams, uh, working with budgets, budgeting. Um, I got other skills, you know, labor relations, marketing. I also did sensory analysis out of the University of Manitoba. So I think I got a good skill set that uh, would contribute to being a counselor. Um, I got interested in this about five years ago when I got my property tax bill and it had gone up 500%. So I've been in Port Moody for 30 years, so wow. I was kind of surprised that it went up by that much. And you do the math, it wasn't all inflation. So I was curious, where did all this money go? Because in my neighborhood, it looked pretty much the same as it did in 1980. Mm. So that year was a by-election, so I went down, signed up. After I did that, I went, oh man, what did I do? I, I wasn't ready for that, I don't know anything about politics. So it was a vertical learning curve. I tried that out and uh, didn't make it. I got about 5% of the boat, uh, vote, I was self-funded. And the next year was the full election. So I thought, okay, I cut my teeth, try it again. Uh, went into that, and again, I got 5% of the boat, and I was self-funded. And uh, But I learned a lot at that time, and there's a lot of committees, a lot of meetings you can go to. It was actually way too many. So I decided to focus on the finance committee meetings because I thought, you know, anything that's going to drive the city has got to come from the finance side. So learn about what they do, where the money goes, and then you can make good or bad choices on what to do forward. So that really propelled me into it, and... I learned a lot over those five years, met a lot of people at the city hall. Uh, I volunteered uh, with some community groups locally and attended the meetings and spoke at public input and that kind of stuff. So I think I've got a good sense now of how it works, who the people are there that you need to talk to. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, getting a spot there this year and testing out you know, my chops at council. So, so let's uh, on the finance side, because obviously you have me intrigued by that. Okay. Because we've got two, we've got two lines here. We've got the COVID finance period, and we've got yeah. it sounds when the you know, numbers you're talking about are pre-COVID, uh, and uh, in a sense, uh, an old, a different mayor at that point. Oh, in terms of the yeah, the, yeah, yeah, so yeah the finance timeline. So, what did you learn when you went through that sort of analysis process with the finance with in Port Moody, and what what do you want to sort of from your discovery pass on to the the constituents? Well, I think. COVID was good for one, for one thing only. It showed that Port Moody could run on like a life support budget. That's about 3%. Mm. So I think the following year they asked for 7.2%. So when you're watching the finance, you say, okay, well, you can just cover your cost. You can't do anything. It's no fun stuff, nothing. But 3%, you can, you can survive. So where does the other 4.2% go? That's the question. So you have to start digging in. And yes, there's a lot goes for you know the departments fire water sewer all that kind of stuff but they also waste a lot of money and you can add up numerous cases you know 35,000 here 75,000 there 200,000 there and when you hit 480,000 that's one percent of the total city budget that's redirected away from the core city services fire water all that kind of stuff so I learned you can actually save money and reduce pressure on taxation if you just control what you're spending, spend the money wisely, and focus on the core city uh, businesses, or services, I should say. And, you know, everybody complains when their taxes go up by 1%, so you should strive to save that. And in some cases, if it compounded any particular year, it could have been 2 or 3% that was directed away from core services. And that money could have went there, and again, you would have a more stable tax base. So that part was really interesting, and that's the challenge, I think, for most of the 
public offices at the municipal level is, can you get back to basics, live within your means, and control that, and still deliver the core services that the residents are used to? Yeah, so on the finance side, though, I mean, in a, in a, in a city, really, the outside of, you know, sort of bylaw infringement and sort of finding, uh, fines and stuff like that, uh, or movies coming into town, and, mm -hmm. and those are a very small percent. I mean, the majority of it comes from from property tax yep. a percentage. So, mm -hmm. and you see, Port Moody is gro going through a serious growth. Like it, it, it has, it's, it's almost like it's small, but it's very confined. Yep. And you know, you've got all these developers chomping to get their their properties on on the front. So, mm -hmm. so based on that core services principle, is growth of the city manageable or good, or is it a conflict to to that core principle or does, does it make, it seems to me, and it's just my you know, ignorance, it's like you have more people move in so yes. that, that in a sense the services should be distributed among more people, but it doesn't seem doesn't to always, work way, doesn't no. work that way. So, no. so why is that? Because the, in the municipal charter, the city's allowed to tax you for the services they deliver. So when you increase more people, the amount of services you need go up, so your cash flow increases, so you're taxing everybody and you're spending more. So it, it's kind of neutral, mm. just a wash. So when you create more, yes, you, you do get more tax uh, cash flow revenue, that's true. And if it sticks to the city, which it doesn't, because it's supposed to be using that for services. And the other side of that coin is, is when new people come in and they're say they're in some of these developments, apartments, townhouses, that kind of thing, they don't have the luxury of someone who's a single family homeowner to go out and relax in your backyard. So when they go out, they want to go out and they need services when you go out. They need recreation, they need uh, you know, restaurants, other amenities that businesses will bring in. That drives up the cost to the city because now you had one tennis court, now you need five. You have a, one pool, now they want an indoor pool. So all, that, all of a sudden, you see an increase in your tax revenue when your service costs come up. Mm. So now you're, you're net neutral again. Mm. So to get out of that spiral or that, what do you call that, gerbil wheel, is you have to create other forms of revenue. So in Port Moody, the billboards is one example of that. Fees are another thing of that. And the density bonus from development is another thing like that. But you also have to realize that the density bonus money is a one-time thing. When the development is built, you get that ish shot of income, and so you have to you know, be able to manage that properly for all the other expenses you have to pay. So that's not a steady stream for Port Moody. That's just cash infusions for every building. But isn't that kind of like the, I guess, from, from a political perspective, mm -hmm. like, you know, people are always asking for another rink. They're always asking mm -hmm. for another field, right? So they're, they're, exactly. they're, they're asking for even, you know, I think in this region we're relatively, I don't think we underserve, if, if, if that makes sense, uh, any social services. I mean, if you're Vancouver, you, you're obviously, a big part of your budget is, is social mm -hmm. support. And we're getting those challenges coming to this region. Mm -hmm. So, so um, what would you cut or what should we be, what should we be going back to then to, to get ourselves into a more, I guess, uh, palatable tax rate? Well, I think the first thing is you have to cut off the fat. If you're wasting 1% of your budget on peripheral stuff, that automatically boosts your, your revenues up. So you have to work on that first. Then you have to make the city more efficient. You know, there's a lot of examples where you know, they could have done something for $1 and it cost them $5. So those things, I think, are real tangible things that you can do without actually having to physically cut something. You know, if you get to the point where you need to cut that, then you have to look at all the, normally the soft things get cut first. But Port Moody, I would say, they do 80% of the stuff right. 20% needs to be improved. It's not, we're not in any kind of crisis or anything like that, but um, you really have to be aware of that. And as, as you can turn the city like an elephant, you know, elephants don't move very fast. You've got to push it over in this direction so a lot of that money sticks back to the core, and then you can use that to pay down your debt. You can do some of those other soft services you're talking about for uh, homeless people or affordable housing, all that other kind of stuff, where you have more money available. Right now, Port Moody is going paycheck to paycheck. They don't have, they don't have extra money for that stuff. So let's, you, you hit the word affordable. So, I mean, uh, the, the finance side, is there anything else you want to add on the finance that we may have missed in, in your research uh, that you want to pass on? No, I think, I think we just want to highlight that uh, you, you have to start looking for revenue outside of taxation right. because that's the only way that you actually can move forward and do some stuff that you want to do. So if you're comfortable with that, mm -hmm. just the, 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 you know, we look at affordability, yep. and, and I'll, I'll pose this 
this, when you talk about other revenue streams outside of advertisement, outside of... Uh, well, advertisement is another form of revenue stream that's not based on taxation, so that would be yeah. in the basket. Yeah, it's, but you can, it's like anything, though, you can, after a while, you got a city full of billboards, so, I mean, there's... there's, there's well, you can advertise on the garbage trucks, you can, you can, your vendors, you can approach your vendors and say, look, we're running a recycling business here, why aren't you supporting us and do advertising on those trucks? Yeah. It pays for the fuel and everything else, so there's things like that you can do, too. Yeah, so be, I guess take your sales and your marketing head and just try yeah. to figure out where to stick a label. Yeah. Like, we've got GM Place, why don't we have GM Garbage? Yeah. So, um, that was, was that a joke? I don't know. But uh, No, but, that's the dumpster fire. <laughs> that's the dumpster fire. Yeah. So, so let's talk about affordable housing, because one of the things I think that, uh, and, and this may be a question that just interested in your thoughts on that, is uh, you talk about new revenue streams, mm -hmm. um, and typically when you see affordable housing, one of the assets that a city has is land. Mm -hmm. In many cases, it could be vacant, um, and, and so the whole process of having this vacant land could be turned into, when you look at that, your property taxes, 75% of it is your land value. Your, your physical wood and nails is pretty pretty small. So the concept of the city becoming part of a, I guess, a landlord, you know, is a revenue stream. Do you, how, how, do you, how do you sort of, when people talk about that as a, a possible solution for affordable housing, how do you, how do you approach that? Well, that's a good question because Port Moody, as you already highlighted, we're like a horseshoe. We're jammed in the corner. We have traffic problems because everybody wants to drive through Port Moody to get where they're going. And lastly, Port Moody's land poor. Mm -hmm. We don't have a whole lot of developable land. I think there's four projects coming through, and we have the uh, old fire hall site, and they're thinking about relocating the workshop. That piece of property is the most expensive property that Port Moody has. So I think you really have to think hard about what you want to do there. But if you go back to affordability, I think the discussion you have to recognize that it starts from your personal income. So you can't paint the affordability brush with everybody. So someone at the lower uh, rung of the economic ladder has a different definition of affordability, someone in the middle or someone at the top. So if you want to increase affordability, I think you need to put processes in there like reduce spending that relieves taxation, create more revenue, that relieves taxation, so now you have a little bit more income in your pocket. Then you have to create more housing. And of that housing you create, you need more forms of that housing. Studio, one, two, three bedrooms, apartments, townhomes, single family homes, whatever it be. Now, as an individual with a little bit more income, there may be some options for you to purchase something that now is more affordable. That's all at the market level. Then you can go back and look at these developments that are coming in. Coronation Park is huge. Moody Center is huge, Flavelle Oceanfront is huge, um, Westport is also huge. And now you're doing the trade-off with the developers over density for those other soft amenities like affordable housing, below market rentals, all that kind of stuff. Mm. That is where your gamesmanship comes in so that the developer can walk away with $2 in his pocket and you come away with affordable housing, seniors housing, all that kind of stuff. And over those 5,000 I think people are talking about in those four projects, I'm sure you can get a good percentage of affordability and low market rentals in there. I think that's the way Port Moody has to go. Uh, if you had lots of land, then I think you could go and partner up with BC Housing and some other people and put in a nice project in there. But I'm concerned about that whole um, section for the rec center all the way down to Rocky Point Park. If another 20,000 people come in, that's gonna, they're gonna wanna flood that area, so putting something in the fire hall and the uh, workshop site without fully knowing what you're gonna need prematurely, I think you need to sit on that and wait. Mm -hmm. That is a nice piece of property, and yes, you can do a lot of stuff with that, so you could lease it for 100 years if you wanted to and go that route, put in seniors housing, put in you know other sort of medical services, that kind of stuff. But I think the community needs to make that choice and go through the official community plan process and let them decide what do, what do they want to see for that whole center, which is kind of like the key core of Port Moody? Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but I, I guess it, it, the, the, the hard part of that question was the city becoming more like a landlord. I mean, in a sense, you're talking a broker that's saying we need more, you know, a mix in this building that basically is uh, affordable, right? Whether that means, and that's a, that means different things, different people. Well, I don't know if you need to own it to achieve the end game. Okay. Right? I don't think you need to own it. And even if you did own it, the city doesn't have the skills to manage that kind of a facility anyway. You'd have to subcontract to BC Housing or somebody else. Like I think there's one that, one facility, Woodland Park, I think they partnered with BC Housing and they're 
working on affordable rentals in there, and the city's, you know, not involved with that at all, other than the land was there. Yeah. I guess for me, you know, you keep hearing the word free market, you know, someone is renting them and, and making a business out of it, and, you know, you're obviously a businessman yourself, but it just seems like you could find somebody who could manage it well and probably, you know, take that profit from it, but it seems like we're, politicians are averse to that being a bad, you know, it's like kind of like a, a fast ferry, you know, they want, you want to move that along real quick. Cause it, I'm not sure what, what, what you're going with that. Just, just, um, well, let's use an analogy. If I have a four acres of land or I have a bunch of land and I basically take the land and sell the land and the, and the developer comes along and builds this and great you sell place. sell it, you got one shot, cash One shot, you're That's done, you right? Did, yeah. And then all of a sudden you realize that, that that 17 million with so many suites becomes, you know, maybe 200 million in, in assets and you can sell it and you could probably make eight to $10 million a year in rentals, right? That itself, you could hire a property management company that could literally manage that mm -hmm. and run it and say, oh, here's your profits, you know, instead of it going to this developer. Well, you're talking about market rentals now, right? Uh, even 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 subsidized, because because I think market rental, like as you know, is, is the market. So if people with higher incomes come in or higher value jobs, mm -hmm. then the people who don't have those jobs are really moving somewhere else. I mean, mm -hmm. you... So that this is kind of the and well, that's the same model as the uh, developers propose. We'll build a 30-story yeah. building. The ones at the top are full price, and then they subsidize the ones at the bottom. And the near model is well, the city just does that. Yeah, or the city should own it. I guess. I guess, I guess it just seems. It just seems. I guess for me, um, you know, I'm looking at when you look at other models. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I have the answer. It's just you look. At, it's like in the English system when they used to have council houses yeah. that was run by the council, right? Yeah. And they moved away from that, and then they're probably thinking, oh, we've got to get back into that again. So you know, as as uh, as politicians are not ec you know finance economic people, they make decisions that are four years based. Mm -hmm. I just don't know if we're really looking at this whole affordability thing. And saying this is the this is the strategy that gets us out of this hole. It's like we've we've come into a bunch of different sticks. So I'm just curious because you you know you talk about this new revenue stream. Um, I'm not I'm not opposed to any other form of revenue stream. Um, I was just sort of soundboarding of what yeah. the city was saying. They didn't want to get involved and to be into that. Yeah. But I'm not opposed to that. If you if you can do a you know a, a P and L on that to see what kind of revenue you can generate, offset your costs. Um, why wouldn't you? Yeah, I, th I think those are options that all should be looked at. Yeah, so I, I, agree. I appreciate yeah. that. So I was giving you the long answer to your question, <laughs> so I apologize. So, so one of one of the things that uh, you know we talked about here is the kind of this uh, environmental side of Port Moody. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a it, it's it's kind of a city across from uh, you know another two cities, right? It's it's it's, it's in, in the sense of it, uh, the environment is huge there. So it's this kind of contrast between protecting the environment and making it beautiful to kayak and at the same time having mm -hmm. some place to live. So that, what is your position on that? Well, first of all, I'd like to say Port Moody is the only place that you can go and walk up to a fish hatchery and watch a fish swim up and go into the, uh, into the uh, hatchery there. That is the most unique thing, I think, in BC. You can't do that anywhere else. So there's a lot of great things like that for Port Moody. And I think everybody that lives there understands that. And one of my things was I was opposed to the... Uh, changes to the environmental sensitive areas and this is where the um, plan now exceeds I think what it was initially set out to do. So they've increased the buffer from the forest from I think it was three meters down to 15 meters and from there there's a new thing though that's new and uh, from the high tide mark 30 meters. So now it's, in, it's flowed into private property and that's caused a bit of alarm because now you're required to go through the city process to change your own property. There's fees and you have to be reviewed, it might be an environmental assessment, you could be declined or approved. And when you look at those properties, there's nobody violating any sort of environmental act. They don't vi violate the Fisheries Act and they comply to the riparian, I'm not saying it, but this is called the riparian act. Or zone, I guess. Yeah, there's a name for it. I, I can't remember exactly yeah. what it is. But so that's all been functioning since the 2000s. So for 20 years, it's been fine. And I think those types of policies that are in place have really done service Port Moody well. There's not a lot of, uh, I, I wouldn't say any egregious environmental catastrophes in Port Moody. I think it, it's nice. And you see that. There's a lot of parks, a lot of green space. And uh, any new development has to conform, <clears throat> excuse me, to the existing. ESA guidelines, right? It's only the proposed changes that 
I'm, I'm in opposition with. It's got nothing to do with the environment. It's just all about your property rights, what you can and can't do there. Yeah. But 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 at the same time, I think you know, uh, you, know you know, the city council in Port, you know, to mm -hmm. predominantly you would say as a stereotype that in in, in Port Moody there's a very strong environmental <laughs> influence, right? Yeah. So 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 um, outside of property rights, it's a sense of you know we've got the Chevron refinery up the hill, we've got yep. the the new the new pipeline is you know being twinned and is making its way silently through our towns. Um, and so when you're on council, I think there's a lot of things that people use, the environment draws their, their decision-making process. So is, where do you see yourself in, in that, those kind of debates? Well, I think there's a common sense approach to everything, right? You can't turn this off and in favor of that. You have to have some common ground. There is an economy that runs in BC. You know, it's a resource-based economy, economy. So I think a lot of those things are still gonna transpire you just have to transition from one to the other in a reasonable fashion. You know, I think uh, for Port Moody, the jewel and the gem is um, getting into hydrogen processing. We've got the hydrothermal plant that's mothballed there that has a huge natural gas line, and we could set up, partner up with some companies in Alberta, bring them out, set up a hydrogen plant there and do carbon fixing. That'd be a whole new industry that would go right in that heavy industry place and bring a new revenue. And that's sort of state-of-the-art technology and hydrogen, you know, you can have green hydrogen produced. That would be fantastic for Port Morty. We should be catering to those types of people and attracting them because we have the raw materials for those guys to go to work. So, uh, you know, last, you know, uh, last election they were talking about resilient cities and, and, mm. and I had no idea what they were talking about. But, <laughs> I don't but, know either. <laughs> yeah, but, but since then, you know, I, and I realize now I, it's like the floods, the fires, you know, all these things that are happening to us. So, you know, what, what is your position on what the city of Port Moody needs to, to do to kind of be more resilient against this, you know, climate change that's coming? I or, think or that's here, a actually. great question because I think you have to look at where does the provincial responsibility end and the city responsibility start? And I think in the flooding, I think there was a lot of this going on. You know, who was supposed to maintain the dike? Who didn't do the dike? And the end result was disaster. So I think when you're getting walking the line between provincial and municipal, there's a fine line there. And I know we live up on a canopy, green canopy in Port Moody that could be ripe for forest fire. I think forest fires is probably more prevalent than something like a flood. Um, and how are we gonna manage that? I don't know. I think you have to, again, go to the team that you have there fire department or talk to the province, how they remediate that kind of thing and get some ideas. Um, that's a little bit out of my lane. I'm not exactly sure how, what to do there, but um, I don't think we should stick our head in the sand. I think we should have some action plans and uh, put those in place so we know at least what to do if something that arise with a flood or a fire. Uh, one of the things you talked about, uh, the, the third pillar, is this campaign financing ca concept. And mm -hmm. you know, in your intro, you talked about you know you've run a couple of times and you're self-funded. Yeah. So, so what's your what's your view on the the sense of uh, you know t to help you there in the sense of the influence of developers we just talked about, and sort of this this you need 6,500 votes or there's a, there's a magic number to yes. get that sixth spot, right? Yep. It changes a lot, but yep. um, not much. And when your voter rate is really low. Yeah. Um, what is your thought, like you're seeing this kind of questioning how people are raising their money, even though we have the rules in place, and the barrier to entry for, for people who maybe can't afford oh, yeah. the you it's, know, it's 10 real. grand. You know, I, I don't think you can run a successful campaign in Port Moody for under $8,000. Yeah. You know, and that's, if you're uh, someone who has really passionate about Port Moody, but you don't have funding, it makes it hard for you to manipulate in that arena. And, and I tried it twice, you know, it, it's, it's not easy. You have to start at two years ahead if you want to knock on everybody's yeah, yeah. door. But I think there's uh, uh, two sides to that story. One, there's a legal amount that anybody, any person can contribute. Mm. So um, as long as you're in accordance with the law, you can accept that donation. Then when you start to fraction it off, developers, special interest groups, unions, and it goes on and on and on, then which one do you pick is you want to demonize. So it's, it's really 
hard to say is it the is it the developer one or is it the uh, say you have a website and you got three thousand people following your website and it's say you're I want more dog parks for Port Moody and they all give you ten dollars and you end up with thirty thousand dollars but if a developer walks up and gives you twelve hundred you're a bad guy because you got twelve hundred but you got thirty thousand from the people who want the new dog park how do you weigh who is unduly influenced by what and I think if you don't have a strong enough moral character to take a 1250 donation from anybody legally you shouldn't be running for city council I don't think you should be swayed by that uh, you should thank them for their donation and your platform is what you're gonna deliver you're not gonna go there tomorrow and say okay dog people you get you know Rocky Point Park is your new dog park I'm just saying that facetiously right, right? but I think that's the problem is what is really going on there and what is the root cause of that statement? I don't know. Some people get a lot of money and endorsed by unions. I, I get zero. You know, so I, I don't know. I think, yeah. it's, I think it's a political topic, and it, it's really good uh, to talk around the coffee table and figure out who does what. But I think a level, level playing field was set up. The, you get your legal limit. I think that's all you can really go by. Yeah, I guess I guess for 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 when you talk about democracy and, yeah. and includes an inclusivity of democracy, you don't want everybody running, of course. Uh, but at the same time, it does seem to be that that they say it's hard to get in, and once you're in, you're it's hard to get them out. Yeah, and and so there is an element of money helps, right? It, it, it does raise your profile. So, um, well, I, it, you know. it, it's it's totally true. You know, if you want to do the mail out, the group mail out at Port Moody, it's four thousand hmm. dollars. Right, and I didn't do that the first two years, and I, I can definitely say it reflected on my performance because you, you don't reach the apartments and the townhouses, the things that you just yeah. can't knock, can't get, can't, in. get in, right? And you, it's hard to do that. So I think it's a real issue, but I think it's um, a red herring. Mm. You know, if, if you get out and you're, you're dedicated and you're passionate about it and you get your message out, people will resonate with you and they'll help you. Yeah. You know, I think that's, that's what you take the, the high road on that one, you yeah. know? I guess I'm happy that the amount that you need, and people use the word successful chance, is as a dollar value that at least is, is communicated. Mm -hmm. So at least I think there's a lot of people who run and they're, they're dropping their 200 bucks to put their name in the, in the hat and then they realize, oh my God, you know, I have to raise that much money. So yeah. it's like a shock almost, right? Well, you, you don't have to, you, you, if you're a good networker and you're willing to put in the time, start early, and what I found I'm trying to do this year is connect with people that have groups that have three or 400 people. So I can talk to less people, but I can expand my reach, yeah. cast my net wider. And I think that was a mistake I did before too. I was knocking on doors, counting up you know, possible uh, voters. And I got pretty close to what I'd knocked on doors, but I would have had to triple that amount, which then I went, oh my, I should have started yeah. you know, six months earlier. Yeah. Right. So your, you can do it. Your algorithm was right. You just <laughs> did, you had the time. So so before we close, and yeah. thanks for coming in, what do you want to say to folks out there who are, you know, who is Richard? We know a little bit about yourself. What are you going to bring to council, and why, did, why, you, why they should pick you? Well, uh, you should pick me because I'm not coming up with any agenda. I don't have a hidden agenda, and I'm not supporting any kind of special interest group on either side of the fence. I have a lot of experience working in senior management and teams, and I understand one person doesn't get the job done. It's everybody on the team gets the job done. So we have to focus on getting the council, as you heard, was kind of like, you know, yin yang there for the last four years. Nothing's happened at Port Moody because it was stagnant or stalemate. So we have to break through that, cooperate, be um, considerate to everybody, and make sure we send the right message to staff, get them on board and get the whole team pulling in the right direction. I think I have the skills to do that. And I, I think I'm a good choice. Well, Richard Arlen, thank you very much for coming in. Yeah. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your candor and sort of uh, having, having a, a great <laughs> discourse, as they say. All right. So, so uh, Richard Bitka is running for councillor in Port Moody. Obviously, he's uh, now this is his third attempt and has learned a lot from the beginning to now. It uh, seems like he has uh, some very interesting thoughts and campaign positions. Check out his website or follow him on social media. Again, it's Patrick McCarthy reporting for Tri-Cities Community Television. Thanks for watching.